Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. And I want to thank you for joining that mission today. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guests, Sir Jing Chong. Sir Jing, are you ready to join the mission? Yes, really excited. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, get you on and uh, talk about what you're doing because I think it's quite interesting. So let me introduce you to the audience. Sir Jing is the portfolio manager and co-founder of Compounder Fund, an investment fund that invests in stocks around the world. Sergin graduated with an engineering degree in 2012, but having been bitten by the investing bug since he was in his late teens, he decided to pursue investing as a career. From January 2013 to October 2019, Sergin served in Motley Fool, Singapore, as a writer, as well as a co-leader of the investing team. One of his career highlights with Fool Singapore was to help its flagship investment newsletter outperform a global stock market benchmark by nearly two times over a three and a half year period. Besides running Compounder Fund today with his co-founder, Jeremy Chia, the both of them also have an investing blog, The Good Investors, where they share their thoughts about investing and life. So, uh, Serging, why don't you take a moment and tell us about the unique value you are bringing to this wonderful world? Yeah, thanks. So you mentioned uh, the investment block that Jeremy and I run, as well as the investment fund that we do that we run as well. So um, through the website for both the fund and the block, Jeremy and I write about investing related topics that interest us and that we hope can help readers learn important lessons about the investing world. Um, that's an Italian proverb that the both of us love. That uh, when translated into English, it goes quote A candle loses nothing by lighting another candle end quote. And so through our blog, website and blog, we hope to light the candle of investing for anyone who crosses our path. And uh, the writing we do is out of passion. Uh, we have no idea how many people read our work because all we care about is sharing our thoughts. And uh, we just want to light as many candles as we can. Mm. And so are you, are you guys writers as opposed to speakers or what's your preferred communication style? Uh, I think the both of us are pretty much shy in person. So we much rather communicate through writing than to appearing in public and speaking to people. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, I think we all go out to the world with the with what makes us most comfortable. And I think that's that's part of the key to this whole thing in life is figuring out what what's your way to go out to the world. Tell us a little bit about the fun uh, and and where is the fun domiciled and what type of people are investing in that? Yeah, so the fund is uh, domiciled in the Cayman Islands. Uh, we run it, uh, we, are, we are based in Singapore, but the fund is domiciled in the Cayman Islands. Uh, most of our investors are actually um, Singaporeans, uh, just because, you know, we are, we are based in, in this uh, country uh, that is, I think, a close neighbor to where you are based in, Andrew. So, um, yeah, so we invest in stocks all around the world. It's called Compounder Fund because uh, we want to invest in companies that we think will be able to grow their businesses at high rates over the long run. And we have kind of designed a fund uh, to for its returns to be driven by the underlying business growth of the companies that we invest in. Hence, uh, the word uh, compounder fund. So effectively, you want to invest in compounders. Um, I, I think uh, the word compounders has gotten a pretty bad uh, reputation in the past few years bec uh, because of, um, I think, uh, there's this... Uh, big decline in the stock prices that have been seen in many of the companies that are popularly known as compounders. And so I think that this particular investment style has gotten a bad rep. But I think like what Terry Smith has said, you know, um, just like no cyclist is able to win every leg of a long cycling race, um, I don't think there's any style of investing that can do well in all seasons. So investing styles come and go. Uh, but I think ultimately, over the long run, um, stock prices tend to reflect the underlying growth of business fundamentals. And that's where we want to place our focus on. Mm. And, you know, when you say you invest around the world, there's a lot of markets around the world that may be too small or illiquid. How many markets generally are you looking at? So we really look at companies from all around the world. 
Uh, right now, we have companies uh, that are um, list that are headquartered. I would say in in the U.S., in Norway, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, sorry, in mm. Singapore, in Korea, and a couple of other countries. Um, so it's really um, a I would say broad spectrum of countries that we like to invest in. Ultimately, what we're really, really looking out for are uh, great companies, companies that we think can grow at high rates over the long run, and we think that such companies can be found anywhere in the world. What's more important is uh, what kind of businesses they are in and as the quality of their management team. So we're very happy to fish uh, in any part of the world. Uh, we do kind of have a slight, um, I would say, um, aversion to countries where there has been uh, known to have a lack of respect for the rule of law or for property rights. Because in such, uh, in such jurisdictions, if we were to invest as shareholders, um, we may end up in a situation where uh, our ownership stakes in companies may not be protected by the rule of law in, in that particular country. So in those areas, we might tend to tread a, li a, a lot more carefully. Mm. Um, so right now we have a heavy exposure to companies in the US simply because of uh, the, because we find a lot of companies with the traits that we want uh, that are in the US. So just so happens that, um, so uh, I guess I can talk a little bit about the type of companies that we tend to look out for. Mm. So very quickly, uh, we want companies with large addressable markets, uh, strong balance sheets, management team with integrity and capability. Uh, we want a strong track record of underlying business growth. We want high levels of recurring revenues. Um, and we want a business model that we think can allow a company to generate strong free cash flow over the long run. And uh, it just so happens that a lot of the companies that uh, kind of fit well with this criteria or that we think fit well with this criteria happen to be found in the US, at least for the, uh, at least for the current moment. Mm. And a lot of times when you have those kind of criteria, you find this great list of companies and they're super expensive. Yeah, How do you right. <laughs> think about valuation? Yeah, so I think um, in terms of, uh, so I think ultimately it boils down to the idea that uh, if a stock, if a business does well over the long run, it's stock will too. Um, that's it. So if we invest in a company with a high valuation, but that also has a really great business, we go in knowing full well that um, there could be a compression in its valuation multiple over time. So for mm. example, if we were to invest in a company that's trading at say 40 or 50 times earnings today, we are not expecting it to carry the same kind of valuation five to 10 years down the road. We would expect a compression in the valuation multiple. So what that means is that uh, if we think that the underlying business can grow at 20 or 30%, then we think that the returns that we could generate from the company could perhaps be in the realm of 12 to 15%. So somewhat lower than its underlying business growth because of the compression is valuation multiple. Uh, but we are comfortable with that because uh, we would much rather be wrong on the valuation rather than be wrong on the uh, overall trajectory of the business. Mm, okay. And um, how, do, how do you think about foreign exchange? Whenever you go investing around the world, you end up having to buy the currency oftentimes of that country to be then used to buy the actual stock. I'm curious how you think about that and how do you communicate that to investors? How do, how do you want your investors to think about currency? Yeah, so uh, we are very simple when it comes to managing currency risk. Uh, we do not manage for our currency risk. What we do uh, is we depend on the underlying business growth of the companies that we invest in to carry to bring us the returns, even after factoring in any potential depreciation in the company's underlying currencies. Now, that's it. Um, we are also wary about investing in countries that have a strong history of um, currency depreciation. So mm. if we do invest in a company that's in a country where the currency has been performing really badly for a long period of time because of, I, I guess, um, poor government policies, um, then we will be really careful in terms of um, analyzing that particular company and thinking deeply about whether or not we want to be a long-time owner of uh, such a company. Mm. So basically what you're saying is, um, from a currency perspective, stay away from countries that are, you know, prone to devaluation. You don't want that kind of extreme event happening if you can, you know, stay away from it. And um, and generally think about currency maybe as just offsetting against each other as you build a global portfolio, rather than feeling like you've got to hedge a position against a certain currency. Also, we know that an, a small fund or a, a small investor hedging is just way too expensive anyways. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think for us, there's another uh, layer to, to, to this issue as well. And that is um, we 
we do not think we have any expertise when it comes to managing currencies or understanding the potential future movement of currencies. So we'd rather not stray into unfamiliar territory. Mm -hmm. And are there any markets around the world that you'd like to invest in, but you find that the costs of investing are just too high? It could be the commission, it could be tax audits, it could be you know anything that, that just makes more friction to trading in that market. So, um, so I think uh, in the earlier days of us managing the fund, uh, uh, we used interactive brokers as our as our mm -hmm. brokerage. Um, there were the interactive brokers did not have access to a number of European countries as well as a number of Asian countries. Uh, so I think for us the key issue would be uh the access that interactive brokers would give us. So like if it's not available in interactive brokers, then I think um it becomes a little bit more difficult for us to access. Um, the stocks of of any of countries that are not on the platform, um, and that kind of uh, increases operational cost to us. That uh, we have to think carefully about whether or not we want to bear. Mm. And um, so, with interactive brokerage, are is it actually a fund or an ETF, or are are you managing uh, accounts like sub accounts, or how does it work with with uh, with uh, interactive brokers? Uh, 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 Oh, do you mean how am I managing my fund through interactive brokers? Well, you mentioned that you use interactive brokerage. Is that only for the trading aspect of your fund, right? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay. Only for the trading aspect of my fund. Okay, got it. And um, the other question I had is how many stocks do you normally hold? Like what would be an average holding? Yeah, so before we launched the fund, uh, uh, my partner and I, we have been investing for a number of years individually. Uh, myself, I've been doing it, I was doing it for nearly 10 years before I launched the fund. Mm. Um, and at that point in time, uh, when uh, I had more than 50 companies in the portfolio. So when we launched the fund, uh, we were quite comfortable holding some somewhere between 30 to 50 companies. It's not a very scientific number. Mm. Uh, it's just a number that we think uh, it's um, helps us to serve two purposes. One is uh, helps us to uh, diversify. So that like, because we think that when we invest, um, we are very clear that we are not Warren Buffett. We do not have the mental capacity or the mental bandwidth to be able to uh, know minute details about a company such that uh, we can be certain that if we were to hold like say five stocks, that all these five stocks will end up doing really well. So, mm. so we can't. And so we diversify. So, so that's one reason why we, we are happy to hold like 30 to 50 companies. And the other reason is actually, I think somewhat related, but... Um, by having a large number of um, a relatively larger number of companies, we think that we can spread our bets, uh, and and increase the surface area of uh, positive luck working in our favor. So mm. sometimes, um, you know, you you might invest in a company that you think is like the next Netflix or the next Amazon, for example, but it, it may not turn out it may not turn out to be the case, right? And so, uh, ha having a having a relatively large number of holdings in the portfolio, I think allows us to kind of increase the chances that we can find companies like that. Mm. And how do you handle waiting? Uh, let's say you have 30 to 50 stocks. Are you then saying, okay, we're going heavier waiting into the ideas that we like the most, or are you equal weighting it? Or how are you doing that? Yeah, so um, we, we kind of uh, kept it simple when we launched the fund. We came up with like three or four buckets where we say, okay, this, these are companies that deserve a slightly higher weighting. So say around 4% each. And then there's another bucket that's about 2 to 2.5% each. And then a, another bucket that's about 1% each. And, and so how we thought about those buckets uh, would be like the valuation of the company and also like the, the business risk that we perceive the company to have. So mm -hmm. obviously the riskier the company or the higher the valuation, we tend to have a lower weighting. And the ones that we think are really stable or, or that have a low valuation, uh, we give them a higher weighting. So that was how, uh, how we started. And then... Um, the way we manage the portfolio is really uh, we are firm believers in letting our re winners run. And so over time, the weightages have changed simply because some stocks have gone on to increase or some stocks have gone on to decrease. Um, and so the weightages have changed over time. Uh, and so we kind of uh, let it sit. Uh, we are not trying to manage the weight the weightings of these holdings too too much. Um, in fact, uh, there's this phrase that I really like. I can't remember who I heard it from, but um, it goes something like a uh, portfolio management is like a bar of soap. You know, the tighter you, the more you handle it, the the likelier the soap bar is to to fly out of your hands. Mm. I'm I'm kind of butchering the quote, but it goes something along the yeah. Those lines. yeah. And um. Do you look at things like I don't know correlations or like say oh I don't I love that stock but 
it's just so highly correlated to and other stocks in my portfolio that I don't want to be overexposed to any particular factor like interest rates or something like that? Or is that not really a critical thing when you're building your portfolios? Uh, it's not really a critical thing. Uh, that's it. So, um, for example, we have a pretty heavy exposure to like digital advertising and e-commerce. Mm. Uh, so, like, if we do find attractive opportunities uh, in companies that are also in similar space, we may think a little bit harder about whether or not we want to include that uh, such a company into the portfolio. But um, it's not as. Uh, but I, I guess there are no like hard rules that say that oh, you know, we have reached a certain allocation for for a particular sector, and therefore, like, we no longer want any more exposure to that particular sector. You know, one of the the, the best and worst things of investing is benchmarks, and. On the one hand, you think, well, everybody needs a benchmark so we know how they're doing. But on the other hand, once you become really expert in this world and you've had a lot of experience, you realize that best benchmark is just, you know, is so problematic in that it, you get a distorted message and it starts causing you to make decisions based upon what's happening with the benchmark. But I'm just curious about how you think about benchmarking and what benchmark you use. So uh, with benchmarking, uh, we kind of uh, kept it really simple. Uh, so because so our fund is, uh, we kind of build it to invest in stocks around the world. So what we first thought of was, okay, we need at least some kind of a uh, gauge to figure out our performance relative to a collection of stocks around the world. So I get, so for us, naturally, we just thought of what is like the most well-known uh, global index. Uh, so in our case, we thought the MSCI World Index is probably a good representation. So and when, as we were launching, as we were building the fund, we kind of also uh, knew that there will be heavy uh, kind of weightage towards US listed companies. And so we thought, okay, if that's the case, uh, we should also kind of have a gauge to see how we are doing against a broad-based US market index. So for example, if we were to be outperforming the MSCI World Index, uh, then if we are comparing ourselves against the US index, then we can at least see if our outperformance is simply due to a rising tide in US stocks. Mm. Right? So... In our case, we thought the S&P 500 is a good representation of, uh, uh, of a uh, broad collection of American companies. So that's just how we thought about it. Uh, I don't think, we, we did not put a lot of heavy thinking into what, what is a uh, good or useful benchmark. I think ultimately for us, it's um, uh, can we generate a return over the long run that, it will be, that, we, think, that we hope will be superior to like a, uh, a broad collection of stocks that in the individual investors can gain easy access to? And maybe you could just talk about how you talk to investors about how they should look at returns and risk of your portfolio and maybe just talk a little bit about what performance looks like. Yeah, so maybe I can talk about performance first. So it has been really bad. Uh, so we launched in July 2020. We started investing for the fund in July 2020 and uh, we are down uh, since inception by slightly over 20%. Uh, whereas the the S and P five hundred and both the and the MSCI World Index both are up uh like I think twenty or thirty percent thereabouts so mm. huge uh kind of huge underperformance uh uh by us uh so that hasn't been fun uh but in our but uh when we launched the fund uh we kind of paid a lot of attention and 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 put in a lot of effort to communicate what we were trying to do to our investors and so earlier I said that we kind of designed the fund for its returns to be driven by the underlying business fundamentals of the, of the companies that we own. So that has been kind of like the North Star when we think about how poorly or how well the fund is doing. So mm. Of course, the, re the stock price returns matter, uh, but um, if the underlying business fundamentals are moving in the right direction, then at least we know that uh, we are more or less in the right direction and that um, over the long time, we will get to our destination. The journey can be really rough, uh, but if the underlying business fundamentals remain sound, uh, then we will get there. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because if you started a fund, you know, in 2020, and you didn't invest in the top seven, you know, uh, infotech companies in America, and you said, "Well, I'm going to go for something that's less expensive," uh, you know, there's a lot of good quality companies in America that are making great returns, and the market just didn't reward those. In fact, you could argue that. We're in a recession in America already in the market if you exclude the huge moves that's happened in just the top seven or so, you know, tech stocks. So I would say that that's something that that I'm, I'm assuming that your investors, you know, they understand that and they probably have some exposure in those areas anyway. So. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting that you mentioned. So uh, we do actually have a pretty decent exposure to some of these uh, large uh, tech companies. 
So companies like Microsoft, Amazon, mm-hmm. Meta, uh, Alphabet, these uh, my, my, did I say Microsoft? Yeah. So these are all um companies that are, have a decent or uh heavy weightage in the fund. Uh, but we also do have a large collection of like much smaller caps. Um, uh, as well as uh, companies that when we invested had pretty high valuations. So as like, for example, like we have companies like Shopify. Uh, that hasn't done well since uh mm. since we invested uh partly because uh it had a high valuation uh when we went in and then uh when its business was growing really well and then this its business growth kind of slowed down because it had uh some pull forward in because of COVID and I guess uh there was uh in that and the market got really worried about uh Shopify's future growth uh but um the way we see it is that. I, I think that's a really interesting chart uh, about uh, e-commerce retail sales as a percentage of total retail sales in the US. And you can see that in uh, in 2020, early 2020, there was a big spike in that particular percentage. And then it went down, but now it's starting to grow with the trend line again. And I think that when that down, and I think that this particular chart kind of is a good representation for quite a quite a large number of the companies that we have in our portfolio. So uh, when it became kind of clearer that there was some form of COVID pull forward, and the growth rates, so they were still growing, but the growth rates declined. I think like there, there was seemed to us at least that there was a huge overreaction uh to like their potential growth opportunities. But like as as uh is the case now with like uh how the e-commerce industry is growing, these companies are still continuing to grow and they have resumed their trend line pre-pandemic trend line. So uh yeah, so that's how that's how we how we see it. We think that mo- a lot of our companies are uh facing a similar situation as like what e-commerce as a whole has gone through uh, during, before and after the pandemic. It's such a, a challenge. I know I have um, a few strategies that I do here in Thailand that are ETF strategies. And one of them in particular is, you know, not done well and it's frustrating and it's, 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 but I also, you know, as I tell my clients that, you know, the most important thing is that you stick to what, you believe and you stick to your method and you stick to your model because everything, nothing, as you've already said, nothing performs, you know, outperforms all the time. And you're going to go through periods of underperformance. And if you're, if you're switching out of things at that period of underperformance, you end up losing a lot. And I just, I love what Meb Faber talks about. He's got his, uh, his show that he does. And he talks about how long, can somebody go, you know, how long should you go uh, with, with your strategy underperforming? And he says 10 years. He's, he's just like, like, it's not unusual for a good strategy to underperform for 10 years. I'm like, that is crazy. I mean, nobody can, but his, his point is that, you know, it's longer than you think. And, you know, uh, and Meb was a, was a guest on the show. His, he was episode 165 and his title was avoid the physical pain of loss by sticking to your investment plan. So some good yeah, advice that, there, I think. Yeah, that it is. It is. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I think it makes total sense. Um, I think uh, switching out of strategies uh, when you're facing a drawdown is, I guess, one of the worst things uh, that can be done. But that's it. It's also tricky because um, you never know if like this drawdown is something that's permanent because your strategy just happened to have had a, a uh, purple patch previously, right? And then mm. you're thinking, oh, I, I guess this this style of investing or this strategy actually works. Uh, when it's actually when it was actually able to work only in a very specific uh point in time with very specific circumstances. So that's actually something that I think uh, thought thought about uh, quite a bit when I was launching the fund. So I mentioned earlier that I was uh, investing for about ten years before I launched the fund. Um, and so the way that I invested individually and the way that I'm investing for the fund right now is uh, identical. Mm. Uh, so. Um, I, I but I thought a lot about has my so I did pretty well uh, when I was investing uh, individually. Um, my portfolio was I think uh generated a return of about nineteen percent compounded over the over that uh, over that period. So that's like October twenty ten to around June twenty twenty. So about nineteen percent compounded. Uh, a few, slightly uh was quite, I think had a pretty healthy margin over the S and P five hundred. Um, and so I thought kind of I was thinking. Had my performance been a uh, stroke of luck, purely a stroke of luck, or is it like due to my skill? And I believe that performance has both an element of luck and skill. And I was trying to determine which was the heavier element. And so I came to the conclusion, or rather I, I kind of derived comfort that perhaps there was a heavy element of skill involved in there because uh, throughout those 
uh, nine and a half or uh, roughly 10 years, uh, I was very consistent in how I invested. So I was looking at stocks as a piece of a business. I was holding very long term. I kind of, um, so uh, for some perspective, like uh, by the time, uh, by June 2020, I still had stocks that I had invested in in October 2010. There were stocks I invested in 2011, 2012, 2013 that were still in the portfolio by June 2020. So uh, I invested for the really long run. I was focused on business performance. I ignored, I, I was aware of uh, what was happening around the world, but I did not use that as a basis for making my investment decisions. And so when I thought about that, I thought, okay, maybe uh, there is uh, some element of uh, skill involved in there. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you sharing all about what you're doing. It's interesting. It's exciting. So, um, you know, uh, for anybody that wants to learn more, I'll have the link in the show notes. Uh, but now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us about the circumstance leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yeah, sure. So uh, my worst investment ever can actually be traced back to the time I bought my first ever stocks. So earlier I mentioned October 2010. So back then I bought six stocks at one go uh, and two of them uh, were Atwood Oceanics and National Oil Well Varco or NOV. So Atwood was an owner of oil rigs while NOV supplied parts and equipment that helped keep oil rigs running. Um, I sold Atwood in September 2016 and that position gave me a, gave me a loss of about 77%. Uh, NOV was sold in June 2017, and I was down about 31% in that position. So the AdWood loss is actually pretty big, 77% decline, but it's actually not even the biggest loss that I have faced in the stock market. But nonetheless, I consider AdWood and NOV both to be my worst investment ever because uh, I had no idea what I was doing. So I, I invested in them because uh, I wanted to be diversified according to sectors. So I thought that oil and gas was a sector that is that was worth investing in since the demand for oil would likely remain strong for a long time. Turns out my view was actually right that the demand for oil uh, would be strong for a long time. But I was only right to a small extent and I was actually wrong on uh, on hindsight on two important areas. So the first is that uh, there are some sectors that uh, may not be worth investing in for the long run because their economic characteristics are actually poor. So for instance, uh, there was this study by McKinsey, I think published in 2006 or 2007 or something, that showed that the energy, materials, and transport sectors have historically produced very poor returns on invested capital over a long period of time. So that's the first uh, kind of uh, area where I got wrong. And then the second thing is that um, the global demand for oil actually did indeed grow quite strongly from 2010 to 2016. So uh, the annual consumption of oil actually increased from around 86 million barrels to around 97 million barrels in that time period. But uh, oil prices also fell significantly over that, over that time frame. So from around $80 per barrel to around $50 per barrel. So it turned out that um, I had and actually currently still have very little ability to predict the price level for oil. And when I invested in Edwood and NOV, I had completely missed out on the important fact that the price of oil would have an outsized impact on the business fortunes of both these companies. So like if I were to look back at Edwood, for example, uh, its revenue and net income in 2010 were about 650 million US dollars. Uh, so the the the, do the dollars that I'll be talking about would be US in, in yep. the US dollars. So in so Edwards' revenue and net income in 2010 were about 650 million dollars and 257 million dollars respectively. Uh, by 2016, its revenue had actually increased to a billion, and its net income had uh, but its net income was un unchanged at about 265 million. But the important thing here is that its return on equity had actually fallen from 21% to 9% uh, in, that, in that time frame. And that happened while its balance sheet worsened dramatically because uh, its total debt, Edward's total debt, had actually ballooned from about $230 million to $1.2 billion. So, and uh, if you look at uh, NOV, so from 2010 to 2016, uh, its revenue actually declined quite uh, significantly from $12.2 billion to $7.2 billion. And his net income actually collapsed from a positive $1.7 billion to a loss of $2.4 billion. So uh, their, their business fortunes were heavily affected by the price of oil, even though the demand for oil remained strong. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's my uh, worst investment ever. And how would you describe the lessons that you learned from it? So, so I have a few. So uh, the first one is something that uh, I had shared earlier, that there are some sectors that may not be worth investing in because uh, they tend to historically generate poor returns on invested capital. Um, the other lesson is actually to 
pay careful attention to the drivers of a company's um, business results. So uh, what I learned was that there are companies whose business fortunes do not depend on the price movement of commodities. And then there are those who do. Right? And, and, it's, and that is a really important uh, distinction. Mm. And if I were to be looking at a company whose business fortunes are heavily linked to the price movement of a commodity, then I would need to be honest with myself about my ability to understand what drives the actual price movement of that particular um, commodity. Yeah, and you may even be better off just buying the commodity. <laughs> uh, yes, in some cases, yes, absolutely. Uh, this reminds me, I'll, I'll share a couple of things. This reminds me of episode 597, which was Lance Depew. And Lance uh, bought a company called TransOcean uh, back in 2006. And uh, that company was oil rigs and stuff like that and servicing. And he basically wrote it up for a while and then he wrote it all the way down close to zero, you know, very close to zero after so many years uh, and he, he got out of it in like 2020 something, but, um, you know, 2020 and after, and, and Lance, I knew him in Thailand. He lives in the U S now, but you know, I knew of him and we, we knew each other a little bit in Thailand, but the point is he was a, he was a very smart analyst and a smart fund manager, a very smart guy. And I, I had a title that one, you're going to lose despite your best efforts. And I realized that here's a guy that really understands oil and rigs and servicing those and oil prices. He understands that completely and he still struggled. And so that's where these types of companies that are impacted by these external drivers. When I teach valuation to young people, I try to teach them about external drivers versus internal drivers. And, you know, I like, you know, you like a company like, I don't know, let's say McDonald's where they're opening up next, the internal drivers, how many branches or how much revenue per branch, those are internal drivers. And there are external drivers like, you know, what's happening in the global economy and stuff like that. Uh, the price of, you know, meat or the price of potatoes or whatever, but those aren't going to drive it that much compared to companies that are totally driven by external drivers, like shipping companies, like oil companies, like commodity-based companies. And they're just, you've got to be on top of those and you've got to realize that they're, they're just extremely volatile and that you've just got to get out of them at times. And that that's kind of, I, I guess, my biggest takeaway is just the understanding the difference between internal and external drivers. As you mentioned the word drivers, which is a great, great word and a great way to understand what's driving that business forward. And if it's a lot of external drivers, be careful. Anything you would add to that? Nothing to add, I think. Um, so let me ask you, based go. based on what you learned from this experience and what you've continued to learn, what's one action that you'd recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Uh, so I, I I remember that one of the big investing topics in the second half of 2022 was about how the supply and demand dynamics in the oil market could lead to sustained high prices of oil. And around the same time, I also came across a relatively small oil and gas company named Unit Corporation. It's listed in the U.S., uh, the company had three business segments, an upstream business where it produces oil and gas. Uh, it also had a midstream pipeline business transporting oil and gas and uh, had a downstream business where it owns oil rigs. So back then when I came across Unit Corp, that would be like in the second half of 2022, uh, it had a market cap of around 567 million US dollars. Uh, but its upstream business was worth around a billion and its downstream business was worth around 400 million dollars. So even without considering the midstream business, uh, unit corporations upstream and downstream businesses already had a combined worth of around $1.4 billion, which is significantly higher than its market cap back then. And moreover, the company had a net cash balance sheet. So it looks like a really interesting uh, value opportunity, right? Mm. Uh, but uh, the value of unit corp's upstream business was calculated based on oil prices of around $50 per barrel. And the downstream business uh, value was actually based on oil prices being around, I think it was $90 per barrel. So all of these got me thinking back about like uh, what could actually drive oil prices. And so I remember, I recalled my previous experience with Edwood and NOV. And I know I, I have a, had very little ability to predict the movement of oil prices. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the, the commentary on the supply and demand dynamics in the oil market sounded really reasonable. So I, I, I decided to look deeper at the history of oil prices and what actually influenced uh, them. And, and what I found really surprised me. Uh, so... The first thing I, I realized was that over the past four decades, uh, there were about five episodes where oil prices suffered a major crash. Uh, so like the first was 1980 to 1986, when oil prices fell from about 30 to 10. 
And then there was 1990 to 1994, where prices fell from 40 to less than 14. And then there was 2008 and 2009, when oil prices fell from about 140 to around 40. And then 2014 and 2016, when prices fell from 110 to less than 33. And then there was 2000, when oil prices actually fell from 60 to a negative uh, 37, right? First time in history. Um, but throughout this, uh, but this, the interesting thing here is that uh, I, I managed to find data from BP, or I think British Petroleum, which is mm. one of the largest oil producing companies in the world. And the data from BP showed that from 1981 to 2021, which was the past four decades, uh, demand for oil was actually higher than supply in every year. And so in other words, the five major crashes that I mentioned had happened despite demand for oil being higher than supply in every single year. So I, I actually shared this uh, uh, with uh, one of my friends, Eugene Ng, whom I think mm. you yes. interviewed fairly recently. Yes. And um, he, he noticed that the US Energy Information Administration, or the EIA, has its own database as well for long-term uh, oil consumption and uh, production across the world. And the, EIA, the EIA's data was actually similar to that of uh, BP's. So uh, Eugene actually reached out to the EIA and they responded. And, and what they said was that there actually could be errors with the data and they shared some examples uh, with us. Uh, I can't remember what those examples are off the top of my head, but basically what the EIA was saying is that the demand and supply data could have some errors. But in any case, even after knowing that the data could contain errors, uh, I, I still can't tell what the actual demand and supply dynamics of oil were during those five major crashes that happened over the past four decades. So in other words, uh, I, I, I could not develop any form of confidence in the commentary that I saw about the supply and demand dynamics of oil and the uh, how and how these could uh, lead to a sustained high level for oil prices. And, I, and, and because of this, I also could not develop confidence in the thesis for unit corporation, right? So um, this is a kind of, I guess, a long-winded uh, answer to the one action that I would recommend uh, uh, listeners to take uh, based on my experience uh, with my worst investments ever. And that is to really look deeply at what has historically driven the price of a commodity you know, if they're trying to invest in a in a company whose business results depend on the price of the commodity. Mm. Yeah, it's it's just uh, there's so much work to be done on that. And then what you find is that commodities are driven by all of these crazy factors, like a country, you know, or the OPEC trying to hold back, or you know, just perceptions of economic growth and all of that. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, you can hear Eugene Ng's episode, that's 677. The title of that one is Keep Playing the Long-Term Game of Investing. I know you guys think a lot alike. So let me ask you, what is a resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? So my recommendation would actually be Robert Schiller's historical database on US interest rates, US inflation, and uh, valuation, price, and dividend data for U.S. stocks. So uh, the database actually goes back to the 1870s. And so that's about 150 years of data. And the best thing is that it's completely free. Uh, you can Google Robert Schiller data, and, and the first few results that pop up pro will probably be what brings you to that particular database. So um, Robert Schiller's data has nothing to do with like what I've been sharing earlier about like my investments with Edward, NOD, or oil prices or whatnot. Uh, but I, I find it to be a really wonderful trove of data for investors to learn about market history so that they can have some base rates about how stocks, interest rates, and inflation have performed in the past. So uh, like examples of things that I've learned while playing around the data. So I, I learned just how common it is for stocks to decline by 20% or more, you know, mm. even as they are on their way to generating decent long-term returns. So a 20% decline happens about once every one or two years. So sometimes, you know, people freak out when they say, oh, the, the you know, stocks are down by like, 20%, but it is common. And, and I got I, I came to learn about this because I was playing around with the data. And one other interesting thing I also learned is that um the valuation ratios for stocks or US stocks have actually also increased over long periods of time where interest rates have risen. Right. So the, the general uh idea about interest rates and stocks is that when interest rates rise, valuations will compress. Uh but uh but the hist actual historical data kind of shows uh, otherwise. So I think uh, this is important to note because uh, I, I, I find one of the worst mistakes that investors can make is to you know, make uh, what I call uh, if A, then B kind of decision. So it's basically saying that if A happens, then B would happen. But I think, in, in, but I think investing is seldom so clear cut. You know, there are a multitude of factors to, to, to consider. So like mm. um, bringing back to like Robert Schiller's data, 
Uh, so like, you know, if, if uh, someone were, were worried about interest rates and how it could affect stocks, then I think if you, were to have, if you had played the data, then perhaps you would realize that, wow, actually interest rates uh, do not affect stocks in such a clear-cut manner as what conventional wisdom would believe. Mm. Great resource. That's at econ.yale.edu slash tilled shiller slash data. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes. I go through that data all the time. And I've just done so many different research out of that to try to understand the history. And I think that's a good lesson for all of us is understand your history. You know, one of the things that I respect about you is I'm looking at your books. You can't help but see all those books behind you. And I see a lot of the similar books on the bookshelf as I've had. So that's that's great. But it just reminds, I think, all of us to continue to improve. And I I, I think that's that's what's really the exciting thing about investing is that you're constantly improving. Last question, what is your number one goal for the next 12 months? So um, I'm actually more of a uh, process person rather than a goals-oriented person. So I, I do not have any goal uh, for the next 12 months or for like uh, for the future. Uh, what I have, are, I guess, just processes in place that I think can uh, make me a, a better person and a better investor. Uh, so like it's, these are simple things actually. So it's like uh, having a process for eating cleanly uh, getting plenty of exercise, uh, having uh, occasional period for meditation, and just uh, you know having long periods of time throughout the day for reading and thinking. Mm. So just simple things uh, uh, that I'm doing, uh, that I'm putting in place in my life uh, that I hope can make me uh, become a better person and investor. Yeah, that's good. Good. Uh, good ideas for people out there to think about the process, the inputs, because if you get the process and the inputs right eventually you're going to get the outputs right i know i have a mastermind group i do with a group of a group of people in uh every friday and we do an hour long uh, thing that we go through our prior week and we plan for the coming week but what we focus a lot on is our daily habits how are oh, we doing great. on our daily habits because that's part of process that's part of building into your daily life what you want uh what 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 you're willing what you're going to do to get the result or the goal that you're aiming for. So totally love that. Uh, well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. As we conclude, Sir Jing, I want to thank you again for joining the mission. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment do you have any parting words for the audience yes i do so this podcast is actually about our worst investment ever and i think most people who think about their worst investments will think about stocks they bought that then go on to fall tremendously in price maybe because of say a high initial valuation right but i think a timing component also needs to be brought into the picture when thinking about this issue so i'm going to very quickly uh, run through the history of a real company right mm. so if you go back to august 1972 this company had a stock price of four cents and a P ratio that's high of let's call it 55. By December 1972, the stock price had sunk to sorry, December 1974, the stock price had sunk to one cent. So that's a 75% decline. And the P ratio also fell to around seven. So if the story ended here, this can probably belong to like the worst, somebody's worst investment ever uh, episode, right? But the story did not end here. By the end of 1989, the company stock price had reached $3.70. So that's around 90 bagger from the August 1972 price, which equates to a 32% annualized return. And from 1971 to 1989, the company's revenue and earnings per share grew by 41% and 31% per year. So the stock price had actually followed the business's growth very closely, despite a huge drawdown in interim. And so I think knowing all of these, well, this, com this company no longer looks like the answer to somebody's worst investment ever. So that's my point of view, right? And, mm. and, and so the company I'm talking about is actually Walmart. And uh, I think that's a good place to uh, finish my parting words. Yes, excellent. And Walmart is a great example also of a family business. So it is. that is a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott saying, I'll see you on the upside.